Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Well, good morning. It's great to see you here today. We're going to jump into the message in just a moment, but before we do that, would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for the privilege and opportunity to gather here in your house and to lift up the name of your son, Jesus Christ, to worship and praise him. We pray now that as we turn our attention to the word, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, just as you promised, to guide us into all truth. We offer this prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So recent statistics indicate that the average American will live to be 80 years old. Now, for the sake of illustration, let's just say that that same average American spends, oh, the first 22 years of his or her life growing up, getting prepared, getting educated for whatever life may hold. So that leaves 58 years in order to do whatever it is that we're going to do with our lives. But keep in mind that of that 58 years, approximately 22 will be spent sleeping. So that leaves 36 years in the average life to make our mark, to do whatever it is we're going to do with the time that has been given to us. Now, anyone here who is 36 years of age or older knows very well that that amount of time goes by like that. It is the blink of an eye. I can't help but wonder if perhaps that's what the psalmist had in mind in Psalm 90 when he wrote, our day is number 70, maybe 80 years if we're strong, but even those days are filled with trouble and sorrow and they pass by so quickly and then we fly away. Lord, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Wisdom, that's what we're talking about in this sermon series that we're calling Wisdom for Life. The last couple of weeks, Pastor Ken has been talking to us about some issues that all of us deal with from time to time, consulting God's Word to understand what is the wise way to deal with our anger. And then last week, what is the wise way to deal with suffering? Today, we're going to consider what wisdom God's Word has to say about purpose. Why are we here? What is it that we are to do with the days that are given to us? The psalmist understood that there was an intrinsic connection between wisdom and using our days wisely, uh, using our days well, taking into consideration what it is that we are supposed to be doing with these days. And that's so that's what we want to look at in our time together. If you were here about three weeks ago, you know that Ben Stewart provided us with an excellent overview of this question. If you haven't heard that message, I'd encourage you to go to our website later and give it a listen. It's a, it's a great, great sermon. And basically, the, the, the message uh, communicates that life boils down to a big choice for all of us. Are we going to live our life according to our own plans and purposes, or are we going to align ourselves with God's plan and purposes? Now, assuming that you have chosen the latter, that you have chosen to align yourself with God's purposes, or that you are at least considering the possibility, as evidenced by your presence here today, I want to take that question a step further. I want us to consider what does that actually look like in everyday life? How do we go about discovering what God's plan and purpose is for each one of us, and then How do we go about living that? And to guide our thinking, we're going to be looking at a portion of Paul's letter to the Philippians. If you need a Bible, just raise your hands. The ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. The book of Philippians is about halfway into the New Testament. 
It is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in the city of Philippi. And uh, Paul, at the time of the writing, was in prison. So you can imagine that he had ample time to consider a topic like purpose. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. You might want to circle or underline that word mindset. We're going to come back to that. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. In my 22 plus years of pastoral ministry, Sometimes I wish I had a dollar for every occasion that someone has approached me with the very sincere and pressing question, what is God's will for my life? It's an important question, no doubt. It's it's a question that I have asked myself along the way. But I have observed that from time to time, the motive behind that question can be just a bit misguided. You see, because we are finite creatures, we tend to forget that God is thinking in terms of the eternal. We get very focused on specific issues, specific problems, and want God to bring His wisdom, His direction to bear on things like a choice of a career. A significant relationship, perhaps a a possible move to another city. And while certainly God cares about those things and will provide guidance for us, that is not God's primary concern for our lives. That's not the first thing that God is thinking about when He thinks about His plan and purpose for each one of us. No, His purposes are much, much bigger. And whereas we tend to go through life focused singularly on these issues that come up. God, I think, is wanting to lift our heads and invite us to look up and see, hey, I'm up to something so much bigger than any one or combination of those things. There is something eternal that I want to accomplish in and through your life. One of the reasons that Jesus came to earth was to reveal this very truth to us. Jesus is the premier example of an individual whose life was perfectly aligned with God's purposes. Everything that he did, everything that he said, everything that he thought, everything about Jesus reflected the fact that he was perfectly aligned with what God had in mind for his life. And so if you want to understand what God's purpose for our lives is, the best place to start is Jesus. If you want to understand how it is God wants to live in and through you, the place to look is in the life of Jesus. That's why Paul wrote, have this same mindset as Jesus. In other words, learn, commit yourself to think as Jesus thought, to live as as Jesus lived. Therein, you will begin to find yourself lined up with God's perfect plan for your life. Now, the world would say to us, no, 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 no. That's got it backwards. You see, the way to go about it is, first of all, establish the plan. The plan that includes things like going to the right college so that you can be sure and get the right job so that you can be sure and then marry the right person and live in the right city and have the right life. And then once you get all of those things squared away, well, then then you can make room for a little religion. You know, it, it can add just the right sort of 
seasoning to an otherwise well-ordered life. But God takes the world's plan and turns it on its head because God has zero desire to be seasoning in anyone's life. He's not about seasoning. He's about life itself. Living according to God's perfect plan and purpose involves, first of all, a surrender on our part to whatever that may be. A decision of the will to pattern our lives after Jesus' life. And so naturally, the question arises, well then, okay, how did Jesus think? How did he live? What is this pattern that we can invest in and that we can follow with such assurance? Well, look again with me at verse 6 from our passage. Paul, in describing Jesus, uses these words, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. In other words, Jesus understood that a life lived according to God's purposes is a life lived for others. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about us pouring out our lives for other people. It's about us serving other people. It's about us even going to the place of being willing to lay down our lives for others. Just as Jesus, first of all, did for us. Several years ago, I had the distinct and unforgettable privilege of meeting a remarkable woman by the name of uh, Dr. Helen Rosevere. Dr. Rosevere today is 89 years old. She lives in Northern Ireland. But in the 1940s, she was a medical student at Cambridge University. Looking forward, I'm sure, to a successful medical career. But during those Cambridge years, she met Jesus and gave her life to him as a disciple and underwent a radical transformation in her career plans. She decided to become a medical missionary to the African nation of the Congo and went there straight after medical school. And for a number of years, the ministry rocked along just great. Everything went very well. But in the 1960s, the country was plunged into a prolonged, violent civil war. Many lives taken, many lives destroyed. And on one night, some rebels broke into the hospital where Dr. Rosevere was working. And they took her hostage and held her hostage for five months, during which time she endure, endured uh, unspeakable torture. Torture that no person, most particularly a woman, should ever have to endure. When it finally came to an end and she was able to look back on that terrible five-month ordeal, Dr. Rosevere wrote these words. Through the brutal, heartbreaking experience of rape, God met with me with outstretched arms of love. It was an unbelievable experience. He was so utterly there, so totally understanding. His comfort was so complete. And suddenly I knew, I really knew that his love was unutterably sufficient. He understood my desperate misery and mixed up horror of emotional trauma. I knew that Philippians 4.19, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus was true on all levels, not just on a hyper-spiritual shelf where I had tried to relegate it. He was actually offering me the inestimable privilege of, serve, of sharing in some little way in the fellowship of his sufferings. 
through her sufferings, right along with the Congolese people, Dr. Rosevear gained their trust and their undying loyalty to her and to her leadership. And when the war was over, the bond of trust between Dr. Rosevear and the Congolese people enabled her to go on and establish, among other things, a 250-bed hospital that the country had never had before, a maternity ward, a leprosy center. She established a training school for paramedical professionals. She started a midwifery school for young women. She established regional hospitals in the outlying areas and made sure that there was a modern-day communication system connecting those hospitals. She developed a flying doctor service through Missionary Aviation Fellowship where doctors could fly into the bush and treat emergency, acute situations. She established a depot in the capital city where supplies, pharmaceuticals, and hospital supplies could be stored and then shipped out to the regional hospitals. And that's just a glimpse of the many, many ways in which God used this woman who had so freely surrendered herself to his purposes. And when her remarkable ministry came to an end, her staff threw a farewell banquet for her on her last night there in Africa before she returned to Ireland. And after that banquet, she was back in her little room asking herself, was it worth it? Was it worth leaving my home? Was it worth being single my whole life? Was it worth all of the hard work? Was it worth the intense suffering? And in response to those questions, she wrote these words. I suddenly knew with every fiber of my being that these years had been worthwhile, very, very worthwhile, utterly worthwhile, with no room left for regrets or recrimination. I have looked back and tried to count the cost, but I find it swallowed up in privilege. The cost suddenly seems very small and transient in the greatness and permanence of the privilege. My God, what a life surrendered to an almighty God, a loving Savior, and the amazing things that God was then able to do through this woman who was so completely surrendered to him that she would endure the worst that humanity could hand out and still find love in her heart, not only for her God, but for her fellow man as well. Now, obviously, not all of us can live the same sort of experience that Dr. Rosevere has had. But the one thing that every one of us can share in common with Dr. Rosevere is the self-same level of commitment and discipleship that she has to Jesus Christ. Lest you be put off by the horror of her story and think that you could never do anything like that. God does not call all of us to the same destiny, but he does call all of us to the same place of surrender and discipleship. And our destiny is not the point. Where we wind up, how it is that God chooses to use us does not matter. In the end, what matters is whether we have surrendered ourselves to the place that we are willing to be used for whatever he may choose. Do you hear what I'm saying to you this morning, church? That God is speaking to each one of us today and asking us, may I have your life May I use the years that I have given to you for my purposes and for my glory and for the good of your fellow human beings. For some of us, that will be an incredibly high price, like Dr. Rosevere. 
Other situations will turn out differently, but they will be used by God nevertheless. Just last Monday, Pastor Ken got an email from a Faith Bridge family who now lives in South Korea. They have worshipped here at Faith Bridge in years gone by, but for the last three years they have been in South Korea. And I have to tell you, with regard to surrender, to God's purposes and plans, this email is the most encouraging thing that I have read in a long, long time. And I wanted to be sure and share it with you this morning. This is from Graham and Meredith Caver. Perhaps some of you know the Cavers. He wrote, Dear Ken, I've been meaning to write you this letter for quite some time. My wife Meredith and I are members of Faith Bridge, but have been overseas with my job since 2011. After a brief stint in Malaysia, we've been in Ulsan, South Korea. I want to tell you how Faith Bridge is helping to make more and stronger disciples of Jesus Christ way over here in the land of the morning calm. But first, let me tell you a quick story. This is not our first time overseas. And when you move to a different country halfway around the world, you go in with an understanding that life will be different. We observe that folks, ourselves included, often throw the baby out with the bathwater. So while we can't have Tex-Mex food, watch college football, or read the local newspaper, it doesn't mean that we can't be active members of a church. Unfortunately, that is what happened. We use the excuse of being away from the normalcy of home to not take our church life seriously. And we were sad looking back because we had not really grown in our faith during that time. We resolved to do differently for this assignment. So within a few months of arriving in South Korea, we had found a few like-minded couples who agreed to meet each Sunday morning for a worship service. The beginning was modest. We simply huddled around a laptop and streamed a Faith Bridge sermon while the kids watched VeggieTales in another room. But this modest worship service seemed to scratch an itch because we soon found more families that wanted to participate. Three years later, we now meet in a banquet room and routinely have around 35 adults and 20 children representing a range of faith backgrounds and nationalities. There are three Sunday school classes to accommodate the various age groups with a teacher and helper for each class. This summer, we held two separate week-long sessions of Vacation Bible School. The Cool Club, Children of Our Lord, meets once per week directly after school. There are two men's and two women's Bible studies that meet each week. And we also sponsor regular fellowship barbecues, camping trips, and nights out. Our Sunday service is advertised online through local forums and Facebook, as well as expat magazines. We adopted the motto of bloom where you are planted, as we think it perfectly captures the right attitude for an expat. We've taken to calling ourselves the Bloom Church. The stream sermon from Faith Bridge is still the main component of our worship service, though we now show it on a projection screen. Folks really like the challenging Bible-based messages that we get from you and the other pastors at Faith Bridge. In a way, our group is very much like a grow group and a serve team all in one. I know that Meredith and I have become stronger disciples of Jesus Christ through our continued association with Faith Bridge, and I know that it is the same for many others that are a part of the Bloom community. We just want to say thanks for all you do and all that Faith Bridge does. Now, is that an awesome testimony or what? Whether you're talking about Dr. Rosevere or you're talking about the Caver family, both are incredible examples of lives that are surrendered to Jesus Christ and both have done and are doing amazing things in his name. That's why we do what we do at Faith Bridge, especially through our bridging ministry and the opportunity to go and serve our world, both here in Houston and all around the globe. Our heartbeat and our prayer for every single faith bridger is that we would all come to that same place of surrender to his purposes and his plans for his glory and for the good of our own souls and all those that we meet. I'd like for you to take a minute and watch a video of some more adults who've taken up this challenge. And then at the conclusion of that video, 
Seth Martin is going to come and quickly share with you how you can be involved in our outreach efforts. You know, life isn't about just going to work, providing for a family. You know, there, there's a real world that is hurting and in need out there. All the blessings and all the gifts that I've been given are so that I can go and help others. Ah, it gives me such joy. It's so exciting to do this. I love hanging out with my kids in this kind of setting, um, just to see them serve. Not only are you serving them, but in a way they're actually teaching you more. You know, you always receive more than you're actually giving. And so that's always um, a crazy experience. We actually, you know, we were given a vision for why we were doing whatever we were doing. And when there's a purpose behind it, it changes the whole experience for why you're doing something. And you know, you basically understand and you enjoy doing it, all that work. Every time I got to have an intentional conversation with one of the kids on my trip makes my trips, at least for me, totally worth all the time, all the energy, all the effort. We just kind of ask the hard questions. You know, tell me about what's going on in your life or what are you struggling with? Um, what do you think God's doing in your life? Where do you think God wants to take you? My team taught me that God doesn't take pretty pieces and make a pretty picture. He takes your broken pieces and makes a beautiful picture. And that was just one of the biggest things that I took away from that mission trip. True joy and true fulfillment comes from, not from, you know, accumulating things for yourself, but in giving, giving everything up and going to people who are so desperately in need and loving them. The way that God communicates, you know, with us and the way that he can work through us, I definitely stayed. I can, I'm a little bit more aware of how that works because beforehand I didn't really understand that, you know, I kept hearing like the Holy Spirit will guide you, things like that. I mean, I didn't really understand what that meant. I, I did pray, like every night I used to pray, but then I didn't feel like I actually had, you know, the connection with God. I'd see other people, they were on fire for Jesus practically every day, and I was wondering why I didn't feel that. So I thought that, you know, God was basically picking favorites and like in just, you know, giving more of the Holy Spirit to some people than others. But now it's like, it's, yeah, you know, I can, I can clearly see that it's, Basically, you know, it would guide us whenever we, we need it and if we ask, so it was really cool. Mission season makes me so excited. I don't know, I've been talking about it with my friends and we're all talking about like student leader applications and like where we think we're gonna go. I don't know, I'm just so excited. I wanna be super open-minded about it. Every year has been so different and I've learned so much every year and I'm just like, God's taught me a lot. Like what am he, what is he supposed to teach me now? But I'm so excited for next year. You know, at the, at the end of it, I was just amazed at, at the resiliency of these kids. You know, here are the things that they go through, and we were prepared to be amazed by these students, and we were. I, I want to go into the ministry now. It was sort of some kind of, uh, I had, you know, some kind of assumption, but then after the mission trip, I definitely felt that, you know, like, this is for me. But when you send kids off away from parents, um, you get to see their faith, their relationship with Christ, be their own. It's not moms and it's not dads. How they respond to others in need, in hurt, how they lead a sight team, how they cook in the kitchen, how they lead worship, how they, how they do different things, that's them. That's what we want for our kids. You can see it happening and it's, it's beyond fulfilling. For me, a defining moment was not just watching my son, but to watching 13 amazing young people own their faith. To celebrate that, amen. <laughs> Praise God. We are so excited about all that God is doing in and through our student ministry here, in and through a bridging here, what is happening in the kingdom, what, where lives are being transformed, where people are being impacted for the sake of the gospel as it's advanced. It's incredible. And that's what today is about. It's a day to, to kind of pull off and say, this is what we're celebrating. We're not celebrating ourselves. We're celebrating the opportunity that God has given us and the life change and the transformation that God is, is doing not only in us, but through us as, as he seeks to fulfill his mission that he allows us to be a part of. So it's a great day. We get to celebrate it. We want to reflect today. As you can see, there's a student presence down here as we, we look back and celebrate what it is that God has done this past year uh, as a body at Faith Bridge. Uh, we get to lift those things up as a body to hear testimony, to, to share these stories about what God is doing uh, in and through us in the kingdom. We get to celebrate and lift up in worship and our response to those things as a body, we celebrate what God has allowed us to do. And then we get to uh, take a moment just to be inspired, to, to see that, uh, as Dan said, that 
this great commission is for all of us. It's not just for a missionary and that somebody who goes and does, we are all missionaries, we're all called. We're not all called to uh, Cambodia, we're not all called overseas, uh, but we are called right here, right now. And so today can be a very real moment for us as individuals to personally comprehend or to personally consider how is it that God has called me into his kingdom and how am I gonna live out my role? to fulfill that mission. You say, yes, I got it. That's great. That's me. That's us. That's who we are. Let's, let's go for it. What does that look like? How do I get started? Uh, it's actually a lot easier than you may think. Uh, God tells us to love our neighbor, and I think that's the best place to start. Let's start loving our neighbor. Invite your neighbor to dinner. Take a coworker to lunch. Build relationships. Begin to do ministry, to do mission right here where God has placed us. We can serve in our community, we can join a, a, a serve team, we can take our grow group and go and feed hungry people and build relationships and, and fold them in to our community. These are all things that we can do here and now. At Faith Bridge, there's also lots of opportunity to go and to serve. Once you've had your fill here and you're excited about what God's doing here, we can go elsewhere. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see that there is a missions card inside there today, and it's going to highlight a couple of opportunities, namely our student ministry missions program called The Road. We have a kickoff coming up on January 7th. This is the night that we reveal all of our student mission journey opportunities that they'll have in the next calendar year. It's a lot of fun. We actually will present that information in a, in a pretty creative, fun way tonight for students and parents. It is the best way for students to get connected with the road and find out how they can be involved in the mission field this next year. On the other side of your card, you'll see uh, global bridging opportunities for both adults and families as well. There are literally dozens of of, of mission opportunities here and abroad. Uh, and if you're interested in these, you can join a meeting this afternoon at one o'clock upstairs where you can go and learn more about these opportunities. Would you join me in prayer and just as we celebrate these opportunities, as we celebrate the movement of God in and through us and around our uh, communities around the world where we can seek to fulfill this purpose, this mission that God has given us. Lift that up with me, please. God, we love you, and we thank you that you have called us, Lord, that you have given us this purpose. You've given us this ministry, this calling, this reason for living, Lord, and that is to serve and to make you known. I just pray uh, a prayer of celebration and joy as we consider and reflect on all the things that you've been doing, not only in our lives, Lord, but in the lives of those we are serving. We have seen transformation. We've seen impact. We've seen Jesus moving. And we're just so thankful that we can be a part of your work, that you would allow us to even participate in your heavenly agenda. Father, I just pray for those in the room today that are experiencing this call and are wrestling with it, Lord, that you would allow uh, each of us personally to engage in the mission field where we are, that it is not uh, a label that one has to assume in order to go, Lord, but it is a, a purpose down to the core of who we are in our lifestyle that we can do this mission right where you have us in our home, in our neighborhood, in our community, in our workplaces, Lord, that you would inspire us to live missionally with all we've got. And for those that are in the room, Lord, that are feeling the tug to go elsewhere, that you would just uh, lead and guide them on that journey, what you have for them, wherever it may be, that you would begin to lead their heart to uh, great purposes and great impact in the, in the kingdom here and abroad. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the many students in the room today that are celebrated as we consider how they have surrendered their lives to pursue you and to allow you to move through them to see the work of transformation in the kingdom. We just give you this day and we thank you for who you've allowed us to be in your name, Father. We lift these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Postscript from FaithBridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Hi and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Pastor Dan, who just brought to us part three of Wisdom for Life. Today we talked about meaning and purpose, mm -hmm. which um, is a great thing to talk about on Missions Sunday as well. Sure. Um, as we look at this um, call that we have um, to serve others and to make 
Christ known throughout the world. Um, you gave us many great practical ways that we can get involved and that we can serve um, and uh, things that we can do to answer that. But talk to me a little bit about how just on a daily basis you live out that mission in your life and how we can do that as well. Okay. Well, I think it begins, uh, like all things related to God, in the heart. Not so much in activity first, but our heart has to be surrendered so that the actions that flow from the heart are truly representative of uh, surrender to God and not to something else, ego or whatever the case may be. So it, it begins with that posture through prayer and through seeking hard after God. Uh, and then sort of like in concentric circles moving out, it, it starts where you are. Uh, the, the people that you live with, for one thing. Uh, are you a servant in your home to your spouse if you have one, to your kids if you have kids? Moving out from there, uh, perhaps the people that you share I-45 with or 290, um, would they describe your driving habits as being that of a servant or a tyrant? Uh, when you get to work, uh, what is your attitude toward those, those people? Uh, and then, of course, beyond the immediate sort of opportunities, there are the sorts of things that FaithBridge provides. Uh, locally, we've got our Bridging for Tomorrow nonprofit that is serving the underprivileged down below the Beltway. Lots of uh, trips overseas to help continue cultivating that uh, servant mindset and the opportunity to uh, continue to surrender oneself to God's purposes. I suppose if there were uh, an overarching principle to all of it, though, it, it boils down to a, a matter of desire. Is, is this what you really want in life? Because if it's not, it'll show. Uh, we, we tend to do the things that we really want to do. And if being self-centered is what we first of all want, that's going to come through loud and clear. But if our primary desire in life is to serve and to please God, that's going to that's going to become clear as well. Yeah. well. I continue to pray that we see the need of yeah. those around us and those opportunities. Um, so um, the series continues next week mm -hmm. and um, we'll be continuing to another area of wisdom. Right. You want to give us a little insight into the next wisdom that we are going to talk about? Sure. We're going to talk about uh, what the scriptures have to say about stuff. Uh, we live in a country where there is lots and lots of stuff, and uh, many of us own a good bit of that stuff. For good or for ill, it can impact our walk with God and our overall experience of life. And so we want to consider what, what does the Bible have to say about our attitude towards stuff, what we do with our stuff, and uh, ultimately how that stuff shapes the sort of person that we're becoming. Great. I'll look forward to hearing it. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.